I want to now one quote from your book that I think just really struck me, which is that I think I want to come back to now, which is this term even ontogenesis and the dynamics between culture, ontogenesis, and and institutions and um, being so. I'm just going to, so in considering this, I'm quoting from your book. You said, "Keep in mind." That intergroup competition and cultural evolution act on the entire psychological institutional package, which include all these avenues into our heads. Strong food sharing norms, for example, may guarantee that fewer people experience acute food shortages as children or infants, thereby avoiding the long term psychological shifts induced by the, such shocks. That is, the evolution of social norms that create well functioning social safety nets ensures that a smaller percentage of children will experience the stressful nutritional deficits that trigger changes in their lifelong impulsivity, self control, and response to stress. At the level of the community, these induced psychological shifts may improve the functioning of certain kinds of institutions, such as banking and credit organizations. Thus, some institutions may, that may spread in part because of they ontogenetically shape a population's psychology. So I'm just trying to trace the richness of this thinking through, which is I've got some kind of core norms, which are a cultural innovation. Maybe not even a deep genetic level, but you're saying at the what I, I want to distinguish here is like genetic change, but like ontogenetic change, which is I as a when Rufus came into the world, I was a tiny baby. Maybe I've got my genes, but if I experience, for example, severe food shortage in my uh, early childhood or my childhood, that we now know that affects how I will be for the rest of my life. My being, Rufus, my ontogenetic uh, coming into the work being is influenced by that. And so what you're saying is that this, by having these cultural norms, you have a population, not even genetically different in this case, but ontogenetically different, who are more safe and secure. They haven't experienced stress, therefore less impulsive, just to summarize that paragraph. I'm just trying to follow it through. And therefore they're more trusting. And this will create a more fertile ground for like banking and credit institutions, which are a classic massive public good that allow us to finance, organize, create enterprise and so on. So this kind of this kind of these kind of loops are i mean where are we inside to explore these kind of chain that, that those kind of rich onto genetic pathways of where like cultural norms change the way of being of a group which then allow new kinds of organization to happen right right and then that can affect the the success of the of the groups that adopt that. So you might adopt sharing mm -hmm. norms. You might think, well, that's not going to have a big effect, but because it shifts people's psychology, allows you to develop better institutions than you would otherwise, then you can outcompete groups that that don't do that, that don't have right. some kind of safety net, for example. Right. And that's like one example. I mean, I think one I just want to bring up also, I don't know whether it's the same, but in the book, which we haven't touched on, that I thought was the effect of polyandry. You also mentioned quite a bit in the book that when people have multiple wives, this has a whole, this creates a whole like group of have nots, basically men who don't have partners and that affects their risk taking violence and other kind of behavior versus other society. Could you say a bit about that example as well? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's polygyny. And so polygyny, when, sorry, poly, not polyandry, polygyny, pardon yeah. me. So the easiest way to think about this is imagine a world where you have equal numbers of, of men and women. And if, you know, if, if one, if there's one man, one woman, then you end up, everybody gets a mate. But if you imagine now some of the women prefer or are forced to either way it works um, to marry higher status males, then you end up with this growing pool of low status unmarried men who can't get into the marriage and mating market, or they have to take big risks in order to get into the game. They have to generate enough wealth, and this could involve crime or it could lead them to use substances or other kinds of personal abuses. So um, by enforcing monogamy, you actually, and people don't like the economic language, but you effectively redistribute women so that uh, men who otherwise wouldn't have a chance to be fathers and husbands can get into the marriage and mating market. And there's good reason to think that this has hormonal effects in the sense that uh, when men marry and then when they have their first children in monogamous societies, they have declines in testosterone. Uh, I mean, they have now have a stake in the future with a, with a child, right? So they have a reason to kind of stay around and make sure they can, can be a father. They have high paternity certainty because it's a monogamous society. Whereas in the world where you have polygyny, 
you have these guys taking risks in order to, to get into the mating and marriage market. And you essentially don't even enlist a big chunk of your men as fathers and husbands. Um, so they just are just this pool, which could cause problems. And so the point this to go through the story. So a cultural norm about monogamy versus polygyny um, shifts the well it, it has this big effect on the outcome of people who have partners or don't have partners which leads to a basically a more stable um more harmonious society in a way where people have more of a stake in the future or at least more of everyone has a stake in the future and we think that that could have significant effect again on the functioning of of societies um in in, in a variety of other ways Is yeah that right? yeah that's the idea and so i mean there's lots of interesting correlational data and kind of ways to look at that. Uh, one data set that I really like is, doesn't come from a polygynous situation, but it's a, it's a different situation that creates a similar effect. And that's the one child policy in China. So China begins uh, limiting families to only having one child. And in China, there's a bias to have males because of the patrilineal patriarchal system. So this means that beginning in the late seventies, uh, different provinces of China begin increasing their sex ratio of males. They're basically creating that excess pool of males that are going to have trouble finding mates because there's more males than females. And then what you see is that later, 18 years later, China's crime rate begins going up as in the provinces that first implemented the policy because they were the first ones to have this excess of males. And then those guys cause problems because they are not fathers and husbands and don't have the stake in the future and haven't had the psychological shift that goes along with that. So it's an interesting way of testing the idea. So to keep going around this open, I now want to come to the section where we talk a bit about potential implications and particularly about, I guess we could say conscious cultural evolution or like cultivating cultural evolution. So a lot of these things happen by chance. What crudely we're saying, like in the story is like, maybe this cultural evolution that even forms being that forms institutions that then form, you know, in a big loop, start forming culture and so on again. And one example uh, here is the West. So I just want to maybe walk something through actually that we haven't emphasized about that is one of the things that came out in the West. That's really unusual. It's a level of um, kind of stranger trust. Is that, I mean, how, how would you put it? Like out, out group trust. Is, is that correct? Could you just tell listeners what is, what is that? What is that feature? And, how is the West unusual in that school? Yeah, so I mean, the idea, the way I like to think about it, is just the trust in uh, that you would have in somebody you'd meet for the first time who you don't have any uh, any particular affiliation with or not of your ethnic group. How much would you trust them? And uh, you know what we find around the world across all societies is not surprisingly, people tend to trust members of their family, members of their ethnic group, people from the same neighborhood more than they trust these more distant foreigners, people from another religion, people from another country. So the real question is, is how close are those? Uh, can, you know, can, can you make that smaller? And what we find is that, you know, the societies, the Western descent societies tend to have uh, less distrust of these more socially distant individuals than societies with intensive kinship, where there can often be a really large divide between, you know, this, this in-group and the out group, the people you, you meet, you, you know, you've met for the first time. Uh, and so then this just varies around the world and how much the out group is distrusted, essentially. And I think in your, in your book, you mentioned like Germany comes like number one in the world for like, or close to for the number of the rate at which they trust out group people. And just to check, does this, does this involve a reduction in in group trust? Or is it more that it's leveling up of like trusting strangers? It's mostly leveling up. You're, you're just trusting the strangers more. You're not trusting your family and stuff less. Right. I mean, I think it's small down and mostly but, up. But it's mostly up. And what, what I'm just trying to emphasize this maybe for myself and for li listeners, and I, I, I kind of ask you, Joe, is that that's the example where outgroup trust is just kind of massive for building like markets or trade. I mean, you talk about this quite a lot in your book, right? I mean, trade is really hard by default. Right. I mean... But and, you know, we, we, we have to trust strangers all the time. And I think people often don't even appreciate how often we trust strangers. And even just, um, I mean, I was just traveling and in some, in lots of places, they have built a wall around their house, right? Because right? <laughs> they don't want outsiders to come in. Whereas I'm sitting in a house where, 
you know, I have glass windows all over my house and those are very easy to break if someone wanted to come in. So there's kind of even a, a, a trust in this, just the basic way you organize a neighborhood. Right. I mean, I remember the example I felt was even extreme for Europe was I went to Finland, uh, which I think is a very interesting society generally in that regard. And, you know, I was like interviewing them about, um, you know, Finns. They were like, there's a big lake in central Helsinki. And they were like, oh, there are all these, you know, games, you know, like, uh, you know, tennis rackets or bats, you know, and balls and things and things would go on the water in these things. Was, and they're like, they're all unlocked. That you you can anyone could go in and just use them and no one takes them away or vandalize whatever the thing is and that's obviously just to emphasize to, to to ourselves it's this is a huge public good if you don't have that either those things don't exist or you have to spend a lot of resources protecting locking up uh, restricting those things um there's sure. huge gains uh societally when those things happen um but they're vulnerable to the kind of pr prisoner's dilemma um so why I'm mentioning this is that that, that growth in out, in out group trust, which is related to being weird, to the psychological differences, to the way you see others, the fact that they feel guilty before God, you know, like you're going to trust someone. If, if you know, if they steal your stuff, they're going to have, you know, they're going to have to be tortured, you know, Rakal, Rishkalnikov, uh, you know, in crime and punishment only really exists in a, I mean, he's weird. I mean, I know he's in Russia, but he's obviously tormented by guilt about murdering the woman um this you're going to be a lot happier in a society where you know Rakashnikov is going to be so tortured by Gil that he's going to kind of turn himself in than in a society where people you know don't feel that they maybe feel shame or something there may be other sanctions but I'm just saying if I understand it this was by complete chance an accident something that potentially explains a lot of why the West had markets uh, the scale they did why they had trade the scale they did why a lot of these things that were there to allow like early capitalism, early um, democracy to flourish. Is that, is that my reading correct of like some of what yeah, you're absolutely, saying? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there's lots of in institutions like uh, financial markets where you make investments, say in a joint stock company that really seem to be influenced by the amount of uh, impersonal trust that societies have. So even if you look at Italy, right? The provinces in Italy that have high levels of impersonal trust, People just holding income constant invest more in stocks and less in other kinds of things, just because you have to have trust in this and strangers, right? You're just putting your money into the ether sometimes, it feels like. So my question now is we're in a moment in human history, uh, human civilization on this planet, where we obviously face some very big uh, collective action problems and public goods. We have faced the climate crisis. Um, we face... Uh, challenges in a way because we encounter the other where we need to trust uh both across countries but even within countries in a way maybe th that we that we haven't before um what do you think that we could learn from any of this in terms of if we were if we were designed if we were going back you know and we were we were like the church elders and they had actually had all this intention they were like we're going to create this whole program that will uh, uh you know influence the way of being and seeing the world that will in a thousand years lead to what would we what kind of things would be encouraged then? what kind of things do you think we know about that encourage um you know maybe even greater trust or compassion or understanding or i don't know what features would enable us to to address the kind of challenges that we face in the world today yeah um, well, so I've been trying to look at this in my lab, uh, at the, the variation, say, among U.S. counties in this stuff. And consistent with the ideas that are in the weirdest people in the world, something like um, mitigating shocks seems to be important. Uh, so places in the U.S. that have been hit by more shocks tend to be uh, tighter in terms of their trust circle and less uh, morally universalistic, which was one of the psychological features of weirdness and you know, seeing morals as applying to everybody as opposed to some small subgroup. And so if you're able to mitigate shocks, you can, just like we were talking about with the, um, with the food, you know, the, with the social safety nets, but also you have to mitigate climate shocks and mitigate economic shocks, because these things seem to have this tightening effect on trust and, and moral universalism. Another one, which is non-intuitive for people, is in the book, I talk about the effects of intergroup competition. And it's this interesting study by Patrick Francois and his colleagues, economists from the University of British Columbia, in which one of the ideas in cultural evolution is that groups compete and you need to be more cooperative in order to survive. And at the level of companies or firms, this might be 
facts about your corporate culture or how you motivate people to cooperate, things like that, organizational structures. But in places where there was more competition amongst firms, people actually got more trusting over time because the, you know, the companies were doing things, they had to be more cooperative in order to compete. So they were generating more cooperative employees. And so that and other data suggests that there is this effect of making sure you have some competition amongst firms. Um, and that's something to be wary of, like in the US today with these you know, really large companies that often don't have that much competition. So that could be a, a non-intuitive way to increase trust. To have a bit more competition, you mean, in a way? Yeah, have more competition. You're generating intergroup competition. Um, you can generate too much, right? But so there's an there's an optimal level. But uh, so and this is this gets to another basic idea of cultural evolution, which is that it's often difficult to see all the implications for these policy adjustments. So you always want to take what I think of as a Darwinian approach and do lots of little experiments well, and 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 pay attention to see what how the outcome is, and then pick the best and then go from there, kind of thing. I mean, this this was something that I was always um, wondering about. Uh, was what what do we know about actually doing those kind of experiments? Well, I remember, like, I think the Shine uh, at MIT was, you know, the kind of father of, you know, corporate culture, but saying that they would do, at one point they would do these experiments where they get groups of people together. I mean, obviously they were very similar and then like kind of allow them to be for two weeks, like have no, they have to kind of like norm, storm, come up with something. What do we know about these tweaks? I mean, how do we, maybe even if we're not doing it intentionally, but we're just tracking people trying out different stuff. How do we know, you know, how, yeah, what would a program like that look like where we were like, you know, the example I have in my mind just say is, is an example. We say one area that you mentioned the book I'm very interested in is let's say religion. I mean, religion is kind of has a bad name since the enlightenment in a way. Um, but in fact, in, you know, group dynamics, group cohesion, all this stuff, it's kind of fundamental. And I always say joke that even if we don't have a religion, we have a religion right now, which is like materialism or, you know, whatever we believe, you know, we have faith of some kind in certain things. And you see that during the COVID pandemic, if people don't trust science, for example, you know, don't you trust the science? It, it's not something you're able to verify yourself. You have to have some kind of faith. My, the example I was just coming to was like, there are many, many uh, like retreat centers or, um, or even youth, youth, uh, you know, retreats, you know, people go, you know, they might go out to the wilderness for a week, or they go out, you know, they go for a month to do this, or they, you know, or they're in the scouts, or, and we just have no, we don't really know um, what happened, like, you know, maybe some of those programs are coming up with little tweaks that are incredibly effective for forming group dynamics. Um, it's similarly, like, while there's obviously a huge demand in the business school literature for, like, studies of corporate culture, I don't know. How, I, my impression has never been how systematic it is. Like we're not at a point where we had like a really systematic set of measures of culture. We go out to like hundreds of corporations and like almost have like you know we kind of regularly are able to kind of sample their I don't know their Slack chat and like be like oh this is how the culture has evolved here. You know we're we're really in our infancy at, at watching culture develop or evolve in real time and seeing what learning what works in the most positive sense. Like what what allows people to feel more safe and secure. What allow what kind of environments. Um, what what is too much? You just mentioned this point that you know that it's like growth as a human being needs safety and challenge. You know, we always think this of kids. You know, if we just if we just coddle all our kids totally and protect them from everything in the world, they they won't grow up. At the same time, we obviously don't want to just you know here you go in the crocodile pen. You know, right, right. <laughs> there's some. So what what do you think would be exciting in that kind of area? If you could wave a wand or you had you know, what what would you what kind of studies would you like to be doing or like what would you yeah like to i mean well two levels one at the level of, of governments state governments or national governments could have explicit experimental programs where different districts or regions or counties <laughs> try different variants of organizational structure or uh, property rights or property rules you know any number of things uh, companies could try different managing strategies, different ways to develop uh, cooperative social norms and have different parts of some large company implement these different strategies. Potentially, you could crowdsource the strategies. You could say, you know, we're going to have a competition the way they have programming competitions, you know, suggest ways we can organize this feature of, of our corporate life or this feature of our state law or whatever, and then you know, you want to try it out and then see if it starts working. And then if one place it seems to be working really well, you know, try it in the next place and see if it, it changes things there. Um, 
So, you know, we know how to do randomized control experiments now. We just need to use them, I think, more, and we need to crowdsource it because, you know, it's often hard for people who are actually in it to think outside the box. But if you, you know, these competitions seem to be, people seem to be interested in and like to do them, um, you know, have people design, you know, a different way of doing something. And, and in particular, I mean, this question, I guess, is one of the things that is noticeable about the past was it was highly connected to religion. This example of the weird, you know, the weirdest people in the world. I mean, many of these features came from religious, even today, things that we might need, which is to feel f fellowship with someone it, all across the world or someone else who's dealing with the climate, the impact is very directly of climate crisis, but I'm not, you know, I, I don't know. I live in, I live in Scotland or whatever. I live in uh, Canada right now. And I'm, well, Canada is being affected now, but you know, there's how those kind of things that like nourish compassion or deep connection with others, these do go back to often things that were cultivated in spiritual or religious traditions. Do you, do you, I mean, do you think, I mean, I guess this is a provocative way, but you know, there's something that happened, obviously, in the Western trajectory, maybe d deeper, but famous, you know, Weber, that, you know, the magic's going out of the world with, with the incredible scientific successes. There was also this kind of materialism. Do you think there's an aspect where we somehow need to find, you know, s something again, if we're going to like rise up to the challenges that we face now of, of uh, so it might not be a, a religion in the traditional sense, but something that, again, speaks to these deeper aspects of our human connection. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think that is missing. And I especially think related to that, that these um, successful societies seem to have, uh, they seem to be hierarchical in the sense that their people often feel bonded to a smaller community of face-to-face -face individuals that are embedded in some larger community. And they, you know, you can have trust in strangers, but you still have this local community where, you know, people know your name and, you know, you, uh, you really have a sense of community, right? This small group, this interdependent group, people who you can rely on to babysit your kid if you need it or something like that. Um, I think we need to find ways to cultivate those and figure out, and religion might provide some tools for doing that. So things like rituals, shared sense of meaning, um, those kinds of things can really bring people together. You know, I'm thinking of kind of community. Yes, projects. yes. I mean, the jokes I sometimes have is that in the West, sometimes we're running on fumes. You know what I mean? It, there's there's an aspect where we, we are trading on a, a very high trust and actually a very moralistic, a very high morality attitude, but without the thing that created it. You know, it's like the tank's empty. And I mentioned this just simply, you know, growing up, just seeing nihilism, you know, sometimes my friend, you know, people would do things, you know, be like, I remember once a friend of mine just ripping apart a rose when I was a teenager. And I was like, to him, I was like, why are you doing that? You know, it's like, why not the rose as a whole is more beautiful. He's like, well, there's no right or wrong anymore. You know, and if you've read Brett Easton Ellis, there's this kind of less, I don't know if you're like less than zero or even American Psycho, I think it's a very compelling uh, story about a lostness or David Foster Wallace, who's, a more famous, um, I don't know if you know, like Infinite Jess, he died, I mean, tragically he died in 2008, he killed himself. But I think one of the great writers of recent American memory, this kind of sense of lostness, right? Of, you know, where is the moral value anymore? You know, what what's the, what's the meaning of things? That There's no purpose to life. I mean, obviously, you know, th there's this very strong sense of that. Um, and I sort of say that we, there's, the funny thing is that in underneath us is a very strong morality. You know, I think of my father, well, my father was an atheist in the end and grown up as a kind of a Christian. His parents were very strong Protestants, whatever. And yet he was incredibly moral and like, you know, but in a way he was like, but I can't, I don't know why anymore. You know, it's like, I'll do all these things. I think we should be like this, but there's no, you know, what's the purpose of life? I don't know. And I think right. that there's a thing where sometimes the wheels will come off much later than you think, just like things have a low, slow burn that famous comment of Weber that the magic or the, you know, the magic has gone out of the world. We, we, you know, there's an aspect where you feel that in, in some parts of our society, this craving for a meaning or craving for a moral sense. And some of that, unfortunately then gets, well, I would say, I'm just going to speak for myself, can get channeled into a kind of reactionary direction. Mm -hmm. Just as I think the lostness that Germans felt after the second world war, um, after the first world war, sorry, 
um, got channeled. You know, there was a huge loss nurse, you know, basically pro modernism was getting broken down and into that vacuum, we know what went. I just think that there's, there's something that this point of running on fumes, that some of the things that you talk about in your book, we, we are still benefiting from those, but it's like, you know, yeah, or well, Looney Tunes, we're running over the cliff. And there's an aspect where something needs to come back in that world to renew ourselves. And I think this point about what's so incredible for you in the book is, while it was, and it probably will happen again by accident, we can maybe be more conscious about seeing what comes in our garden, you know? And I wonder what, um, you know, or, or, you know, the other example I had was, um, that I just wonder about is, you know, I, at the end, my, my partner's Taiwanese, you know, is it easier to add individualism into a collective society or to bring more collectivism back into an individual society? Is, I mean, is there a point where maybe our individualism has swung too far, you know, bowling alone? What, what do you think on those kind of front? You know, do you, do you yeah, think? Yeah, I mean, so I guess the thing that I think that would be a productive line would be to try to use a selection and variation with lots of different intentional communities you know, trying different ways to bring people together, well, whether it's the shared meaning, harvesting elements of religious ritual, using meditation. Um, and so well, I don't know which of these variants is going to work. I know they all seem to have reasons to think they might and just let a, let a thousand flowers bloom and then, you know, see which ones spread and which ones people like being a part of and um, build that kind of local sense of community that doesn't, that's still morally universalistic but gives people that kind of warm hug feeling that you get from being in a community where everybody knows you and some people have your back. And that kind of thing. So would that, just to say, if we, if we were doing a research program, this is absolutely fascinating. One would start like tracking the, the what I call the, we could call the ecology of practice. I think that's, I don't know, what, what do you call it in the actual discipline? Like, because obviously culture, I mean, it's a classic challenge, right? Culture, there's culture at multiple levels, right? There's the culture of a town, there's a culture of a nation and so on. But, or, you know, people could call it a meanplex, but this, I like this, these set of practices, rituals, uh, beliefs, views and values. Would that be a thing to start looking at different intentional communities around the world or different regions and actually tracking that? Because we could kind of learn what works maybe in a way that would be, as you're saying, I think it's not that maybe we would design anything. It would be more about like looking at our garden and being like, oh, that plant is doing really well. Let's give it more water. Maybe we can learn what it was about that part or the soil there that was really great. Would that be a project where you started to like survey those kind of more alternative communities where that's things will, will bubble up just like the Christians were the alternative community of the Roman empire. And then, and then I mean, the, the one thing that I think could potentially be a service would be to, if, once that data begins to accumulate, then, gr then groups could look at that data and see and get ideas basically. So there could be cross fertilization. So a group who's pretty successful, but is looking for ways to, you know, um, build a bigger sense of meaning or get people to cooperate more notices that some other group is doing this practice and then they they pull that practice into their approach that kind of thing and what, what just to ask so what kind of if, if you were thinking about this what kind of things would you try like what kind of what kind of features would you track of culture and what kind of standardized um I don't know, surveys or tools, like how, you know, it, it doesn't need to be an ethnographic survey or are there now like more things where we could be like, okay, you know, here's a checklist of, you know, how would you go about this kind of, you know, effort? Yeah, I mean, well, I would look at different, well, one would be the organizational forms, um, governments, uh, governance of the community, uh, recruiting strategies, uh, norms about interaction, um, any, so you're looking for things that give people a shared sense of meaning or give people the sense that they're in the same boat, um, norms for, you know, about how they treat each other, underlying ideological beliefs, of course, any supernatural beliefs, um, shared practices. So if they're, if they're meditation or they have dances or um, they share food together, all of these things have already been associated with sort of internal pro-sociality. The reason I'm also, I mean, asking is I also wonder about whether there's something of a U-shape here uh, problem. What I mean by that is, so this is an area, I mean, there's some study, right? There's, I mean, there's this work on kibbutzes by the um, uh, the gentleman at, at Stanford, right? There's this economist at Stanford. I think you probably ran out of it. I think it's like this. Yeah, I can't, I don't know. I can't call the name, but yeah. Yeah. Um, because I was very interested in kibbutzes as a good example, right? Which ones made it, which ones didn't, what could we find out? Um. The question I have is one of the challenges that we have at the moment 
the I call it, it's like I want to play my music when I want problem. You know, like the challenge that you have is the study of let's say intentional communities and, and of, of religious, it's what they 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 kind of you're either quite individualistic essentially or you're quite collectivist, if you see what I mean. And it's trying to be in the middle is hard, but we kind of want to people want to be in the middle. This is one of my questions of is it is it actually possible or are there just like two equilibrium states where you know you're either pretty hardcore, like we really are like we do, you know, we're really quite religious, for example, you know, we all do these practices, we believe in this quite strong thing, or like everyone does their own thing, which is kind of the other end of the spectrum. You know, yes, I lived, I live in a tract house next to you and we need to mow the lawn and there's like some maybe stuff about how we maintain the drive, but kind of I do my own thing. I paint my house the way I want to paint it. Um, what what stable equilibria are there in the, in between? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a great question and I would love to see some research on that. But I mean, so I, I think the U-shape is one plausible hypothesis, but it could be that there are particular configurations. Maybe maybe most of it doesn't work, but there's a couple configurations that do work and the key would be finding finding that that small plateau. <laughs> exactly that would be really fascinating right something that particularly if it was on a steps to somewhere or to something new because the sense to, to put it simply someone else you know i i i i interviewed to talk about this you know sense of in, the great success of the west you, you put it is individuation becoming individuals this was this incredible victory um that people don't really understand if they live in the west because they just take it for granted but in a way and at the same time we there's also a great value in kind of the more collectivist you know thing i mean again you, you know the example i often have is again my, as i mentioned taiwan but you know taiwan had no problem enforcing a lot of rules about vaccination you know, I, I was there right at the beginning of the pandemic it was incredibly inefficient whereas compared to like i'm, I'm from the uk and somebody said france and others say it's much more complicated um but what we want is we're looking for something that somehow is novel it isn't like we want to go back to a tribal society per se. We want to learn, we want to take things from learnings or things that might inspire us, but we're trying to, in a way, transcend and include, take something from many sides, just as the, the, the Catholic Church somehow did something kind of almost novel. The problem is, we don't know what that is, but we could be, we could be looking for it. I think that, I mean, one of the, the collectivism thing, I think shields things, most existing approaches to collectivism are really kin-based collectivism. Yes. So, one is non-kin-based collectivism, where we're voluntarily joining a group because we we want to, and we sh there's something about that group we like, and you know, and then we can mutually ensure each other, and we can have a lot of the benefits of collectivism without creating something that essentially becomes a clan, right? Yes, yes. So, I mean, in a way, we should be very fair. You're saying to the West is well, actually there was it was incredibly collective relative yeah. to human history. I mean, and monasteries but even even like mass conscription i mean we had people in the first one in england it, it i think conscription was brought in in 1916 i will get my dates wrong at this point but for two years you know britain fought the first world war on pure volunteers in theory going off to serve because they should because of king and country um for good or ill but it's like that's an incredible level of, of collective self-sacrifice um and the question so what you do is if you were you you'd be on the lookout for you know novel it could be novel companies it could be novel things and do you know of any early you know i don't want to call it early warning system i think it early early cultural innovation system we could call it, i don't know um is there anything out there like this yet like some kind of survey or, or like infrastructure for surveying these kind of things and like sharing learnings that might be coming in from the kind of from the kind of frontier of cultural innovation yeah i you know i don't know of anything i would love to know about anything but yeah that sounds like a great I mean, if it doesn't exist, it sounds like a great thing to build. Yes. I mean, my, my other joke was, I mean, because I did stuff in medicine is that, um, you know, there's this huge untapped potential for randomization in a way Like many people go to the doctor and they get, I prefer, you know, they, maybe they get prescribed something very simple that, that is the safe. We don't ran, we could randomize a lot more in life than we do um, and learn a lot from like mass randomization at the level of the primary care doctor. And my point was here is that we have, as far as I could tell, you know, I, li I live very close to one of the largest Zen monasteries in Europe. And I asked them, you know, have you ever administered an in an in and out survey on like just impact? No. Right. I think there's this huge untapped potential for us to learn from these kind of communities um, that we, that we that, you know, that we don't, we are not doing at the moment in a way because we don't have any data. Well, 
as we come to the end, is there anything else you'd like to get to share about where you think maybe your research, where's your research going, you hope, in the next five, 10 years? That's the last bit I'd like to ask you, Joe. It's like, what do you see as the kind of next, not frontier, but what's your what's your focus of the research, you and your research team and others in the field at the moment? What do you think are the, like the big unsolved or or open questions that you want to examine at the moment? Well, the, uh, I mean, the, one of the big things we're working on in my lab is um, trying to figure out ways to measure that dark matter we talked about better. So, you know, there's a growing body of digitized texts. And so in my lab, we have U.S. newspapers going back a couple of centuries. And then we're also compiling a repository of Latin texts. And if we can figure out ways to analyze the text uh, using large language models or a variety of uh, looking at the way words are embedded with, among other words, uh, we might be able to measure features of psychology like trust and analytic thinking and individualism from these texts. And if we can get that, then maybe we can see more of the of the dark matter across history. I want to be able to plot changes in features of psychology across centuries. So that's kind of the big game there. Um, and then the other thing that I'm working on is innovation. So pursuing this idea of the collective brain and looking at all the different ways that you can get people to come together or to share ideas and create recombinations and the way that in different historical periods, you've had these flourishings of innovations trying to figure out why you get these flourishings and then why they peter out inevitably. Um, how do you get sustained growth that doesn't require the concept moving around of uh, different innovation centers? And I think at the core of that is this question of recombination, trust, getting the right level of competition, those kinds of things. Okay. And one, um, one other question I just asked, which related to the innovation, uh, well, sorry, cultural innovation at the moment, is we have these kind of surveys now of that you know the european value survey or the world sorry the world value euro social, social survey or the gss uh, i think in the us are there any like mike you know surveys where people, people might even volunteer to participate in them but where we could connect large-scale data on a much more uh individuals over time and see values change so for example you know what's you know what happened over the next 10 years you know is there any are there any projects like that around the world where people are like saying okay you know what could we see or is there, or is there some small area of stockholm where we notice that like oh my god everyone's thinking differently in this way or they're talking you know that kind of thing um maybe totally opt in it could be which would obviously create selection bias but you know is there anything like that out there where we're able to see kind of large-scale cultural evolution in real time or values change and and how they diffuse i mean because the obvious point the, it was making me think when you talked about these Latin texts is to see the diffusion of an idea. I mean, that's already been done in some of these large corporate texts, but value diffusion, you know, there's famous like smoking diffusion or whatever in networks. Is that something that people look at or you're interested in or other people, you know, look at? I'm definitely interested in, and there are the data sets that you mentioned. Uh, there are some data sets in Europe, which are panels in the sense that the same individuals are followed through time. Yes. So could be useful. And in fact, that's one of the data sets that Patrick Francois and his colleagues used to look at how trust changes when people change jobs and went from more competitive jobs to less competitive jobs in less competitive sectors and vice versa. So that's an example of looking at how competition affected, affected your trustworthiness. Um, unfortunately, most of the large scale surveys aren't of the panel structure. They don't track the yes. same time. They just sort of resample from the same geographic locations. So, I mean, that gives you something, but it's not as good. So it'd be good to have more panel data sets. And, and with that, that would always require statistics. You, you could have imagined a world where maybe now there might be some people who opt in to be over time seen over a decade. Because right. I mean, that we, we, just to come back to this point you said about alternative centers, if you're looking for where the culture of tomorrow is coming from, you'd imagine it will pop up in some small area unexpectedly and then, and then, and then somehow spread. Right. because it's successful right right and so and and you might be you might be watching several different centers where different stuff is happening and then the way you get ahead of it is say well we can take some stuff from this guy and some stuff from these these populations and put them together right uh, yeah just that, so you can speed up cultural evolution by keeping an eye on the entire space of where, what's going on yes and so if you today what if like someone someone said to you here's like i don't know probably 10 million dollars wouldn't be enough but what how would you 
I mean, what would be the kind of like, you know, I don't know, the sellotape and, and string way of, of tracking that? Like, if you were interested at the moment, like, where's cultural innovation happening in the world? You know, would you look, would you focus on looking at religions? Would you look at, would you look at faith, you know, online data? Would you look at Twitter? Where would you look to kind of see these kind of things popping up? Yeah, I mean, if you could get people to take surveys, that would be really useful. But I'd want to combine, you know, online behavior with some some amount of survey panel data. Um, you can you can deduce a lot if you people will allow you to track them online and see what they do. Um, yeah, I'll have to think about other other ways, but those would be the big ones. Would be um, tracking people online and getting people to engage in panel panel surveys. And the last question, which is, what about unusual populations? To are there like you know, I've often had the same. If you were looking at cultural examples today that are unusual, you know, I, I always said, I don't know, fin, Finland, the Nordics in general, but Finland is this kind of unusual outlier. Obviously, Israel, the Basque country, uh, New Zealand. Are there any other of these examples? You know, New Zealand, I, I don't know if I mentioned on a previous one. Um, the gentleman who wrote, I forget, my, my name is escaping me. Um, David Hackett Fisher, uh, who's this sort of, who wrote Albion Seed, which is I, I think it's an example of cultural transplantation and and the long, in a way, the dark matter story, but in a much more historical version, um, but with some good empirical data. But his example of New Zealand and the US, that New Zealand is also found like New Zealand and US are both founded by English speaking colonists or settlers, voluntary settlers, um, and yet they have really different political and cultural attitudes. Um, for example, the example here is in the book that I always found fascinating was that basically in the 19th century, the end of the 19th century, the New Zealand limit um, land accumulation. They explicitly pass laws to basically limit land accumulation, which otherwise tends to happen under capitalism, where people just land, you know, particularly in the bad times, cap land gets aggregated, and you end up with these huge land barons, and this is a problem. And the US didn't do that, basically. Um, and other examples like you, you know, New Zealand supports called kinds of like insurance, mutual insurance, that's basically public goods like that works, whereas the US doesn't relatively. And these are two examples of obviously Protestant countries already, you know, with similar, you know, Catholic, but yet with these largely different like political or social outcomes today. And in his story, it's kind of basically the first group were like liberty seeking, fleeing like state persecution. So they have a very big obsession with not having too much state interference. Um, and that limits the behavior of the state. Whereas the New Zealanders were basically obsessed with economic inequality. Most of the people who settled New Zealand in the 19th century were fleeing um, the, the, the Industrial Revolution and the bad aspects of the Industrial Revolution. And they also did a variety of other things, but basically it was a much more like lower middle class, if you want to put it that way, because society was everyone was like homogenous in this way. Um, and I just met, are there any of these like, you know, there's all this other book called Blue Zones. I don't know. Uh, right. if you know which is about where people live a long time but are there these cultural places where you'd be like oh wow you know these site these countries these countries or that even in the us they're like some kind of like special zones which just seem like really unusual for whatever reason and highly performant in some or other way w where yeah. would you think of on that list if you were like looking at either i mean costa rica is another one which is also on the list of people living a long time but there seems to be unusual region in the world or like the Finns, you know completely impoverished after the second world war you know invaded by the russians and the germans or whatever um yeah yeah i mean that's the kind of uh, that would be a fun project to you know try to look for places that are say high in trust and uh, generalized trust and high in um you know moral universalism or something in places you might not expect it or that are discontinuous with surrounding regions or something like that and then yes. you can figure out why right what's going on there um you might get yeah. new ideas and what would you uh, what do you know of any of that just that's a, like that that's kind of where would you where would you say like cultural dark matter was particularly dense in the world in some ways that, that might be unexpected yeah i mean i haven't i haven't done that it would be interesting to do it so i'm not sure i'm not sure where where we might see that <laughs> Well, I just want to say then at this point, just thank you so much, uh, Joe, for your time uh, today and, and others. Um, I think this area of cultural evolution, uh, culturology is, um, I think it's one of the disciplines of the 21st century. I mean, that's my, my uh, uninformed and I'm not very, but I think it's really a breakthrough area in the world today. And so thank you so much as one of the leaders in that area. I know there are many colleagues you've referenced. I just want to acknowledge that we've got to talk to you. And I hope that uh, Life Itself, we will be doing almost like an online 
uh, see, we've got this podcast, but other material that we'll put up about this to educate people, because I think this is an area that really is underappreciated in, in its implication, for example, for policy making, uh, for, for, for co companies, for many others. You know, there's always lip service paid to culture, but this is like transformative work in its scientific and um, empirical underpinning. So I just want to thank you again from life itself, from, my, from myself, for your time today and your contribution.